Good day. In this uh, trip slash lab assignment, it's a two week program looking at natural history. And as you can see, we have a natural history center right at Whedon Island. The uh, Florida Museum of Natural History is in Gainesville. So uh, I definitely recommend visiting that. It is one of the cooler places I've been to in, in the state. Uh, Whedon Island is a beautiful preserve. It's got a kayak trail. It's got a fishing pier. It's got hiking trails. It's got the museum, the cultural history center. I definitely recommend checking out their website and giving them your email address. You'll get a monthly newsletter. They have photography classes and nature hikes and guided kayaks and all kinds of great programs going around to help enrich and make your life here in Tampa Bay all the better. Uh, there, it, one of the displays in the museum is a paleo canoe. Uh, Native Americans uh, obviously lived here and used the ocean for food, for trade. Uh, this canoe was a revelation when it came to protection and trade. Uh, so uh, it's, it's really a nice addition to our museum. That uh, canoe was uh, somewhere around 12, uh, 11, 1200 years old uh, during the uh, Whedon Island or Safety Harbor periods of the uh, Native Americans or Paleo Indians as they're referred to. Uh, you can see that they're hollowing out trees and then using fire to build the canoes in the uh, illustration above. There is the actual canoe that's on display uh, and a bunch of students in studying it, taking notes. They have a lot of information about what life was like uh, here thousands of years ago. Uh, a midden. Midden is something, this is a display from, from the Whedon Island. We, archaeology is kind of a little hobby. I like human archaeology. I think it's kind of cool how humans have progressed. We've always been tied to the oceans. Uh, the oldest settlements uh, in the Americas show people crossed the Bering Straits. Uh, it was a land bridge during the Ice Age and traveled down the coast. We find middens. Middens are mounds. Usually kitchen middens would be what they ate, full of charred remains and shells. Uh, they built middens for their houses where they could sit up, look for trouble. Uh, garbage middens were, were also uh, found and studied. And you can tell a lot about the culture. You'll find broken pottery. You'll find intact pottery. The food that they ate, uh, the, the dwellings, garments, things like that. These middens are important to help piece together culture. So there's a huge display on the middens in the Weedon Island Museum. It shows how intimately tied they were to Tampa Bay and the food they ate and the resources, the tools they used, the pottery they used, which means uh, culture, worship, uh, technology, all that is found from dissecting these middens. Uh, there is also a nice pottery display from the different cultures that uh, were here in Pinellas County. So, you know, it, it's kind of neat to go through. We're not going to spend a lot of time uh, discussing the cultures because this isn't an anthropology class. But while you're at the museum and you're going through it, uh, you can see who was here before us and how they were intimately tied to our, uh, our resources. The plankton now, we'll, we'll move to a little marine biology. Uh, plankton for a while, number one, plankton for a while. And you can see there's a uh, crab zoa or zoea, uh, number one. Number two, uh, uh, four is definitely a, uh, a fish larva. Two appears to be an ostracod to me. Uh, I... So that's what we call miroplankton. They're larva, so they're only plankton for a while. Plankton for a while, miroplankton. Uh, they 
camouflage himself by being clear or nearly clear, uh, transparent. When you are visiting the museum, if you are, if it's open, again, sometimes open, sometimes not, uh, it, you know, take images, take notes at what they are, uh, because uh, it's part of a future uh, lab, the Plankton Lab. The you can see this is a little clearer. I actually have a few of the uh, the things listed, where number one, dinoflagellate, number two, diatom, centric diatom. Uh, so um, number three is a penate diatom. They're they're both diatoms. Uh, number four looks like a filamentous algae. So, uh, phytoplankton, phytoplankton, uh, give off oxygen. There are lungs. Uh, it's estimated that, uh, 70%, 80% oxygen comes from the sea. The majority of that is uh, produced by phytoplankton. So, you know, they provide, they're the lungs, lungs of the world, the, the plankton, the phytoplankton. And the plankton forever, holoplankton, plankton forever. You have your uh, copepod front and center, a, a comb jelly, tenophora, and a foraminifera. Foraminifera are a little shelled amoeba uh, for number three. Those are common zooplankton. Holoplankton, their lives always in the water. Copepods are the most numerous plankton. I'm gonna go with numerous zooplankton in Tampa Bay. Because phytoplankton can bloom, then it can die back. But copepod, most numerous plankton, uh, zooplankton. Uh, they also have oliths, which are ear stones. Uh, kind of cool. Helps, uh, you know, they're found in uh, many fish species. And then you can uh, go back and, and look at uh, fossils, what they lived here, what people ate by the oliths in the middens. Uh, so, you know, there's a, uh, little, little unique bone structure inside of the, uh, the catfish. Gopher tortoise. We really have, uh, talked about the gopher tortoise. In the video, you will see there's gopher tortoises, uh, a burrow, a big gopher tortoise burrow. I saw it, scared it away before I could get the camera turned on because it saw me too. Uh, my daughter was a bit disappointed because uh, she she didn't see it, but it scurried back in its uh, its burrow. Wouldn't come back out. Wouldn't come back out. But uh, you can see the uh, picture of the gopher tortoise on the right. Uh, their burrows can be extensive. Can be extensive. Uh, one of the thing about species that uh, you know, sea turtles, gopher tortoises, these species, you can see it takes twenty one years to mature. So. Although they lay a lot of eggs, not many make it to adulthood, then it takes 21 years, so you can't really count on a population to rebound when it takes that long for sexual maturity. Because, uh, you know, you deplete the population, and then it takes 21 years for the offspring of what's left to fill the niche, and not all of them are gonna fill it, uh, recovery is a very slow and arduous process with breeders like this. You can also see that more than 360 different species use the burrows during fire, during fire. That's why they have legal protection. Crabs, uh, the image that I took on the left, uh, we have Mangrove crabs, they're crawling around the mangroves on the boardwalk. Uh, so those are mangrove crabs in the mangrove tree at Whedon Island. Uh, there's multi-level living. You know, you have the ones in the water. The, the image shows a blue crab. And then they live and scavenge the seafloor, uh, the, the intertidal zone, the sand, the mud, the mud flats. Uh, the fiddler crab is there. And then, of course, the penthouse. Uh, the mangrove crabs live up in the trees, so they can live in the water, at the water's edge, or even up in the trees. Multi-level living. Uh, oysters, oysters clean the water. They filter feed. They clean the water. Uh, 
We use them. We build, you can see that's an oyster dome. It's uh, marine grade concrete that is put in the sea and then it's seeded with oyster spat, the uh, larva of oysters, and then the oysters grow and then they grow on top of the and over time it becomes a huge oyster reef. They block waves, so it helps with coastal erosion. They clean the water. Uh, redfish, barnacles, things like that uh, live, live there. Then the sheep's head, they crush the oysters and eat oysters. So, um, you know, whole ecosystems revolve around these oysters. Seahorses, indicator species. What's an indicator species? Seahorses are one. Uh, scallops are another. They're environmentally sensitive. They only can live in water that's clean. So when you find seahorses, when we go do a, uh, a net pull or a seine and we find seahorses, which we often do, or we find scallops, which we sometimes do, I wouldn't say often when we're out, uh, we know that Tampa Bay is recovering. It's a lot cleaner than, than it was in the 70s. Uh, we almost lost all the seagrass, oysters, or not oysters, um, scallops became uh, commercially extinct. We still can't scallop here uh, because of the sewage, the influx of people, the, the wastewater could not be handled. Took, took years for laws and treatment plants to uh, improve. And so it was dumped in the bay. Uh, those nutrients from the sewage cause explosive algal growth. When the algae dies, it sinks and decays. That rotting algae robs oxygen of the water. It becomes anoxic and everything dies. That's a process called eutrophication. And uh, so wastewater, not using fertilizer, uh, new sewage treatment plants, replanting seagrasses have helped the bay recover. And that is a, an environmental success story. Uh, some of the flora that we've seen, uh, upper left, sensitive briar. It's kind of cute, kind of reminds me of a firework shooting off. And if you slide your hand under that little uh, leaf, it curls up, hence the name sensitive, and it's a briar. Below that is our bryophytes. That's moss. That's about all, that, that's what you get out of moss. It's very small, it needs to be moist, it needs to be dark. Uh, no tubes, so it can't grow large because you can't get materials uh, moving around. Beautyberry, beautyberry's uh, one of my favorite plants, uh, upper right, and then below is the algae and fungi, lichens, which actually belongs to kingdom fungi. That uh, is two organisms living in one. That is a reindeer moss. There's also a crustose lichen, but that one's called reindeer moss, although it's really not a moss. It's a lichen. Uh, the red mangroves, you can see there's its prop roots. The red mangroves grow closest to the water's edge. When you watch the video, you'll see identification uh, of the red mangrove. The black mangrove with its pneumatophores can go near the water's edge, but it generally grows a little bit, a little bit higher up uh, in the uh, littoral zone, littoral zone, the intertidal zone, if you will, a little higher up in there. And then in the back, you get the white mangrove. There's uh, the tattered roundish leaves, uh, the flowers that are associated with it. Uh, the crab in the middle of it, you know, that's that's one of the crabs and the mangrove crabs. Uh, then we have the buttonwood, uh, mangroves with a question mark because most do not call them mangroves. Some do, uh, you know, and uh, so there's your buttonwood, buttonwood uh, on the left, buttonwood, and it's little buttons. Salt meadows, uh, that's a depression, and it does not get inundated with water unless there's an extreme tide or a storm. Uh, the water evaporates, leaves salt. Happens again, more salt. 
Over the years, that little depression, salt builds up, so it's a hypersaline depression near the coast. So really things can't grow there very well, too much salt, and you get these um, little succulent salty type plants, the uh, salicornia pickleweed and the seaside purslane. Uh, so the glass warts live there. They live there uh, because they're the only things that can uh, deal with that much salt. Some of the pictures uh, from the observation tower, there it is. And I tell you what, walking up that 92 degree heat, I got to the top and I needed to sit down. Whew, doggies, it was hot. But uh, some of the pictures that I've taken, uh, Tampa and St. Pete, you can see uh, one of the uh, beautiful things. And uh, oftentimes you'll get the vultures swirling around because of the, uh, you know, the, the thermals, especially near the salt, and they, they, they ride the thermals up around the coast. So you get a lot of uh, vultures about eye level uh, because they're soaring over the uh, estuary looking for food. A uh, few of the other things, we found a little box turtle running around once. He was, he was uh, good. Not quite a gopher tortoise, but uh, he did. He did. And uh, the crab orb weaver, upper, upper right, the crab spider there. Uh, very common, very common in uh, our area. So uh, I hope you enjoy Weedon Island. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to when the museum opens up again. Thanks a lot for your time. Have a great day. I forgot. Ah, just kidding. Um, we used to uh, do a lot of sayings in Weedon Island. So I've included a lot of pictures of the estuary from in the water. And uh, you can see those Red mangroves are caked in oysters. Uh, and also there's a crown conch in my hand and it's no longer the snail, but a hermit crab is living inside of it now. So uh, crown conch and hermit crab. This is one of the cooler uh, things. We had a lot of these butterfly rays. They are non-stinging rays that we caught in our seine nets. So uh, we, we caught a bunch over the years, and they're really kind of cool, cartilaginous fish uh, that reside in Weedon Island. Things, uh, most fish biomass in the bay are those little anchovies silver, and silver sides. Uh, they're glass minnows is their mm, common name. Bay anchovies, silver sides all fall into the glass minnow category, because they're clearish. Not quite clear, you can see the uh, lateral line, the silver lateral line, but but glass minnows. Uh, there's some crown conch eggs. They, they look like potato chips on the right. Uh, a juvenile lizard fish, and the silver jenny, or mohara, on the right. Very common silver side, and not silver side, um, very common bait fish. A lot of, uh, a lot of bait fish are called greenbacks uh, because of counter shading. Uh, the back is a little darker, looks green when it's in the water. Uh, bottom part is uh, silver. So when you're below and you look up, the light sky, the silver blends in. If you're a bird looking down, the darker or greener back uh, blends into the darker and greener water. Uh, the lateral line is a sense organ that all fish have. You can see it going right down the sides. Uh, so that detects vibrations. So it's how they move in unison and it helps uh, fight predation as well because they can feel uh, something coming from the side without seeing it. Finger mullet, finger mullet and mullets in general, they jump. So when you see those fish jump, they're mullets, but they eat plankton and uh, graze uh, off of algae, so you're not going to catch them angling. They're netted. Uh, the killifish uh, feeds at the surface, uh, so its mouth is turned up. The tenophora is not a jellyfish. It's called a comb jelly. They don't sting. That uh, is bioluminescent. It's kind of cool when you see them, especially in the right light, little rainbows flicker. They eat plankton. Uh, the parawelk 
and, and uh, that died, and then the crown conch laid eggs on it. So any hard surface uh, will do for an egg, uh, but that is a pear whelk, a predatory snail. Uh, baby snook and mommy snook were both caught on that weed and eat island pier by some students that uh, uh, after, after the trip ended, they, they went and caught some fish. And of course, you, baby snook, nook, 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 nook. Mommy snook, 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 snook. Baby snook, pow! There's a big snook that we got uh, at Lake Magori, a, uh, which we'll be looking at when we talk about Boyd Hill. So now I think the trip is done, and uh, have a good day. Uh, nope, now almost done. The mouth, look at the mouth of the uh, sheep's head there. That is how they scrape barnacles and crush the shells of oysters, things like that. Look at those teeth. And then the mullet, we have some mullet uh, in, in that picture above, and the uh, butterfly ray below. So this is be the third time I say goodbye, but... I'm, I'm fairly confident that's it, so uh, have a great day.